All right, title of the sermon this morning is What Happens After Salvation? What Happens After Salvation? So we all know in this room what it takes to get saved. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a free gift and we are saved eternally. But what I want to explain today, and uh, for those of you who've been going to the church for a while, you've already heard me preach on this topic, but for the newer people, I also want to teach this to you. I want you to understand what actually happens internally once you are saved so then you understand why is it you still sin why there's this struggle that uh, paul is talking about in romans 7 and also that you won't begin to doubt your salvation for the wrong reasons right sometimes you look at yourself your desires the sins that you're still doing you think am i saved so you need to understand what is actually happening once you get saved and why that struggle of doing right and doing wrong is still very present right so what happens after salvation now where i want to start is in first thessalonians 5 and show you that we are a three-part being it says here in verse 23 and the very god of peace sanctify you wholly and i pray god your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you see here that we are made of three parts. We have a spirit, we have a soul, and we have a body. Uh, some people believe that the spirit is the soul and the soul is the spirit. And I don't believe that's the case. I believe these two things are distinct. So we'll talk about them in, in a moment. So if you see here, I've just drawn a diagram and I'll refer to this diagram throughout the sermon. So you can see the green refers to us as we live on the earth and we are a body, a soul, and a spirit. And I'll talk about those as we go on. Now, this idea of us being a three-part being, this is not what I believe the Bible is talking about, being made in God's image. A lot of people think, hey, we are made in God's image. You know, God is a trinity. We are a trinity in, in one sense. You can use this as an analogy, an imperfect analogy to describe the trinity because it's not exactly like the trinity. But some people think that's what the Bible is referring to when it talks about being made in God's image. Now, I'm not denying the fact that, you know, we have similarities with God's nature, where God is a three-in-one being, and we, in one sense, are a three-in-one being as well. We've got a body, soul, and a spirit, and we are one person. But when the Bible talks about being created in God's image, what I believe it's talking about is actually man looking like a man, but woman is not created in God's image because she does not look like a man. So in Genesis 1, we see this phrase here. So God created man in his own image. And notice here, it's only talking about Adam, right? He created man, Adam, in God's image. This is why Adam is called a son of God. He's a created son of God, not a begotten son of God like the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we are children of Adam, right? So we are born, you know, after the image of Adam. Adam was created in God's image. But notice here, it says here, so God created a man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Now, this is not a coincidence that that is him there. Male and female created he them. Now, I came across this, this, I, this, uh, this thing here because there's this, uh, I don't know what it's called, but there's this cult out there and it's, these Koreans will come knocking on your door and they show you this, this, uh, uh, this video. And basically, the, 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 the whole idea, you know, like a lot of different denominations have like their pet doctrine, like Seventh-day Adventist is like Sabbath keeping. Anyway, this Korean uh, religion, I don't know what it is, it started by somebody, but their pet thing was that God was a woman as well, was Mother God and, and things like that. And they would go to this verse to say that, you know, God created man and fe male and female in his image because in the NIV, this verse actually says, in the image of God created he them, male and female created he them. But you can see here in the King James, it's very clear, in the image of God created he him. Because why? Because man was made after God's image, but the woman was created from the rib of the man. Now, so this, is, this phrase is not talking about the fact that we are three-part being. This phrase is not, this is not even a topic of the worth of a man and a woman, right? So we don't get our worth just because, we, you know, man is created in God's image. We have, we have our worth because we are creatures of God. We are human beings, right? But man is created in God's image. Woman is not. If you see here in 1 Corinthians 11, it's probably, you know, I'm sure the men are grateful that women are not created in man's image, right? I think we like the way women look, that they look different, you know? 
1 Corinthians 11. Look at what it says here. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. So this is talking about uh, the hair, long hair of a woman. For as much as he is the image and glory of God. But, so you see here's a difference, but the woman is the glory of the man. So why am I talking about this? I'm just, just touching on this briefly, that when the Bible talks about being made in God's image, it is talking about how a man looks. But when we talk about our nature, yes, there are similarities in our nature with God's nature, even though they're not exactly the same. But we are a three-part being, body, soul, and spirit. Now, I've drawn it this way because the spirit seems to be the, the life that gives life to the soul and to the body. So you can see here, the spirit, really if the spirit is dead, one day the body will die. When the soul leaves the body, why does the body die? Because it no longer has the spirit. And the soul is either alive or not, whether based on whether the spirit is alive or not. But in this, in this, uh, in this diagram, the spirit and the soul are very closely intertwined. Like I said, I think some people mistakenly think they are the same, but they are not. But what is the difference? What is the difference between the body and the soul and the spirit? Well, if you think of the body, the body is our flesh. Right? The body is what we inherited from Adam, you know, the sinful nature. We, we obviously live in the physical world. But our body is our flesh. The body is the reason why we, we sin, right? because of the sin nature that we inherited from Adam. Now, the body is how, you think about it, how we interact with the physical world. Right? So how do we interface with the physical world? Well, we have a body that allows us to interact with the physical world. Now, what is the soul? The soul is who you are. Right? That's your personality. That's you. Right? You live inside your body. That's who you are. Now, this does not change when you get saved. The soul. Right? And this is why you can see a difference here. Now, the spirit is how you... If This is how you interact with the physical world, which is why I've got the body you know, interacting with the physical world. Eh? The spirit... What do you think that is? That's how you interact with the spiritual world. Right? And spirit, you know, Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And that's why I think, you know, your spirit is what's given by God that gives this life. And you can see how your spirit manifests in the physical world because you can hear the spirit. Like you can hear the spirit of God, you hear the word of God, your words are your spirit. Right? That's how you interact with the spiritual world. And that's why when you engage with the spiritual world, it's about speaking, right? That's why you've got to use the two-edged sword, the Word of God, as you go out there and engage in the spiritual world. That's the Spirit. So, you know, what it looks like, you know, and things like that, you know, we don't really know because it's not a physical thing. But like Jesus says in John 3, you can't see the Spirit, but you can hear it. Just like you can hear the Holy Spirit, you can hear the Word of God, you can hear somebody's Spirit. This is why you can judge the spirits, right? Because you can judge false doctrine by what false teachers are teaching by the Word of God, so comparing spiritual things with spiritual, right? So the body is how you interface with the physical world. The spirit is how you interface with the spiritual world. It also gives life to the body and the soul. And the soul is different. The soul is who you are. You can think of the soul as like your mind. That's you. Now, how is it different? Because see, when you get saved, the body, what, your, your spirit is born again. So your spirit dies, your spirit's born again. You can see your spirit changes. Your body also dies and you'll be given a new body one day. But notice what does not change. What does not change is the soul because that's who you are. Right? You're, you're that, you know, that created being of God. It's who you are, put into a body. The spirit is what gives you life. Now the soul and the spirit seems in the Bible that they are very, very closely intertwined. And that's why when the soul leaves the body, we think about death, right? the spirit goes with it. Right? So the spirit is, doesn't, doesn't seem to be linked to the body. The spirit seems to be linked to the soul. Right? So where the soul goes, the spirit goes. That's why the body without the spirit is dead, because the soul has left the body. That's why you die. In Hebrews 4, you can see here this close relationship between the soul and the spirit. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder. So what it's saying? It's saying the Word of God is so sharp that it can discern between two things that are very close together, right? So piercing even to the dividing asunder, right? Cutting in into two, dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner 
of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So you can see there that the soul and spirit is likened to joints and marrow. Just like joints and marrow are really close together, and it's the same with the thoughts and intents of the heart. Well, I mean, what's the difference between a thought and an intent? I mean, you have a thought. You have a thought in your mind. An intent is something you want to do. So even though you think, hey, these aren't all these just thoughts I'm having in my head, but the Bible says that, you, that the, the Bible can divide between just something you're thinking and something you're intending to do, right? Joints and marrow. So you can see the soul and the spirit are different there. Oh, you want to turn that on? I'll turn it on, please. I think that one at the back is still on. So you can see that there's this close relationship between the soul and the spirit. So what happens, what are the stages of spiritual life that somebody goes through from beginning to end? Well, this is what we're going to talk about in this sermon, and then we're going to apply this and show you, you know, with this understanding, why it is that we have this internal struggle. So the first step that we go through is spiritual creation. Spiritual creation. So we are born, and this, you may not know this, because some people uh, understand original sin incorrectly, but we are born spiritually alive. We are born spiritually alive. So you think when we come into this world, we inherit this body, so I've just made it pink, you know, so this is the flesh that we live in. And then God creates the soul and gives the soul a spirit, life, and we are born spiritually alive, right? But then this body that we get from Adam, this is the sin nature that we inherit. In Psalm 51, the Bible says here, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So this verse is not saying that his mother committed fornication or adultery and that's how David was conceived because he was, then he would be a, a bastard child, right? Rather than a son. But it says here, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. What is he referring to? He's referring to this sinful flesh, this sinful nature that we get from Adam. So when it comes to original sin, we inherit Adam's sin nature, right? We do not inherit Adam's guilt, right? So some people misunderstand this. They think, well, original sin means you inherit Adam's guilt, therefore you're born into the world as a, you know, as, as obviously you're born as a sinner with a sin nature, but you are no longer yet guilty of the sin that you have committed. Ephesians 2, look at this. We look at the sin nature here. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past and the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So you see we have this sin nature, so we have a tendency to sin, right? But we are born into the world spiritually alive. Why? Because we are not yet held accountable for that sin until a certain point in time in our life, and we'll talk about that later. Now we do not inherit the guilt of Adam, Right? Deuteronomy 24, 16. Look, the fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. So this is talking about the judgment, like if somebody was to stand before a judge or to stand before God. This is not talking about necessarily the wrath coming upon a nation. Right? Because when the wrath comes upon a nation, sometimes the consequences of somebody's sin can have effects on the family and on the nation. But we're saying that when somebody commits a sin and they stand before a judge, that person is going to be guilty. Their children are not going to be guilty of the sin of the fathers, even though the consequences of that sin can affect generations under the third and fourth generation, like God said. So we see here that we would not inherit Adam's guilt and go to hell for Adam's guilt, right? We go to hell for our own sins. Now, this is why, because we are born spiritually alive, this is why when babies or people who are, like, say, mentally disabled, this is why they go to heaven when they die, right? Because God has not held them accountable for the sin that they have committed, and they are still spiritually alive because of the mental incapacity to do so. Look at Samuel 12. This is a verse that uh, most people will turn to. 
to know that when a baby dies, that baby is in heaven. Second Samuel 12. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. So what's the situation here? This is after David has committed adultery with Bathsheba. He's tried to hide it by killing Uriah the Hittite to cover up his sin. Nathan comes to, uh, you know, to, to confront him, and basically he's found out, and he's, one of his punishments is he's going to lose the child that Bathsheba gave birth to. So here he's praying, he's begging God to spare the life of the child, to not take this child from him. He's fasting and weeping, but once the child dies, he stops. And his servants don't understand. He says, what is, what is this thing? What thing is this that thou hast done? They say, why are you doing this? When the child was alive, you fasted and wept for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou did rise and eat. It doesn't make sense. Wouldn't you be happier that the child was alive and yet when the child is dead, now you're just going about your life as normal? Look what he says here in verse 22. And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? He's saying, Now the child's dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. So you see, it's a very, you know, obviously there are miracles in the Bible where people have been brought back to life, but it's not a normal thing that people go from the, land, the world of the dead to the world of the living, right? But David is assured that his baby, he will see that baby in heaven, right? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. So we know that when babies die, you know, it's an unfortunate thing, but we know that they will be in heaven. We'll see them in heaven one day, whether it's a miscarriage, whether it's an abortion. You know, abortion is still murder, but that murdered child we will see in heaven and it's the same if uh, any child has been lost through some sort of tragedy um, parents can take solace in the fact that they will see that child again if they are of a very young age so we see here this is what it's like if somebody was you know alive and when the child dies their soul and spirit will go to be in heaven and we see here their dead body will be on the ground so the soul and spirit tend to stay together because of that close relationship with it. And like I said, it's because the spirit seems to give the soul life and the soul being in the body is what gives the, the body life because the spirit is there. This is why in James 2, the Bible says here, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So you see that when we die, why does it say body without the spirit is dead? Well, because the spirit also leaves when the soul leaves the body. So the body is an empty shell with just, um, with nothing in it, right? With no life to give it life. So that's the first step. The first step is we are spiritually created. So we are born of Adam. God creates the soul and gives the soul life by giving us a spirit. And then the soul and the spirit being in the body is what gives the body life. Whereas the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now, now we go on to the spiritual death. Now I alluded to the fact that we are born spiritually alive. At what point do we spiritually die? Now this is why I, went, I read Romans 7 this morning. And if you're following along and you saw it, um, but we'll go over that passage right now in verse 7. The Bible says here in Romans 7 verse 7, it says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, I had not known sin, but by the law. So you see the knowledge of sin comes from the knowledge of the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. So notice that. Notice that there was sin there. But it wasn't what Paul is referring to here is he's talking about a time when he was still alive, right? But then when the law came, the knowledge of the law came, he says that knowledge of the law through the law killed him spiritually, right? So you wonder why do babies have an alive spirit even though they're, they're sinners, right? You think of a child, when a child is born, they're selfish, they're greedy, they only think about themselves. They're a sinner, 
right? But, why, but they're still spiritually alive. Why? Because they have not yet gained the knowledge of the law and their sin is dead. Verse 9, look at this. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. Right? Why is he saying that? Because God gave the commandments in order for us to live by them. But unfortunately, through the weakness of the flesh, through the sinfulness of the flesh, and through the weakness of our own self, obeying the flesh rather than the spirit, we sin and then we die. Right? So he's saying here, the commandment was a good thing. But if you don't keep the commandments, you die because of the commandments, because of a lack of keeping the commandments. I found to be under death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? What, what is the that which is good? The commandment. Right? So the commandment is good. Nothing wrong with the commandments. The problem is when we don't keep the commandments. Is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, what is sin? The transgression of the law that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. So this is how we start, right? And when the commandment comes, sin revives and we die. So you can see where the spirit now is a dead spirit. But even though the soul and a dead spirit is still alive in the body, this is why the spirit has no life anymore and it's no longer the soul is only able to follow what is bad. So this is why a person who is not saved, all they can do is sin because their spirit is dead. Right? They have no life in them. So you can see here as we went through Romans 7, there is a time, because people often ask the question, well, when does a child, you know, what, what is the age of accountability? So we're not given a specific age of accountability, but we know that there is a time when a child comes to the knowledge of the law. And when they understand the law, I believe that's when they will also understand how to be saved. So it's a different age, I believe, for every child. But every child gets to an age where it's an age of accountability, where they understand the law, they understand judgment, they understand salvation, and they themselves make the choice to you know, believe or to reject Jesus Christ. But at that age, at that same age they can understand salvation, they can understand that they've broken the law, right? So that's the age where God now holds them accountable for the sins that they have committed because they now have the knowledge of the commandment. And like the Bible says here, their sin was dead, but now the sin revives and then they die. So they go from this to having a dead spirit. Now, this law, you know, even if you say, hey, well, what if somebody lives in a culture or somewhere where they don't, they don't, they don't live in a Christian culture, where they don't understand the laws of God? Well, in Romans 2, it gives us the answer because Romans 2 tells us that people, they know the law intuitively. They know right and wrong and their conscience bears witness. So God has written his law in the hearts of man to know just by nature what is right and what is wrong. So you don't need to grow up learning the Bible and learning to know, you know what is wrong and right morally. Romans 2.14 For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law, look at this, written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So even though they don't have the law, the Bible tells us they have the work of the law written in their hearts, and because they intuitively know what is right and wrong, they are able to set up ways to accuse or, excel, or else excuse one another. And this is why even in non-Bible-believing countries, 
they still have a system of right and wrong. False religions, you know, still have a system of right and wrong. Do unto others this this common morality. And oftentimes, when you go out and preach the gospel, people will try and say this to you to say, "Hey, all, all religions are pretty much the same thing. They all teach, you know, do unto others as you would have done unto you. Right and wrong. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't cheat." don't murder. Yes, because, and now you understand why. Why is there this common thread amongst false religions? Because, you know, the, 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 the laws of God are written on our hearts and our conscience bears witness. But why? What is different when we go and preach the gospel? We're talking about how to be saved from that. How to be saved from that is a different method to other religions um, that are in the world. So again, this is the unbeliever. Right? Body, their soul with a dead spirit. And if they were to die now, right, their soul would separate from their body and it would immediately be in hell, like we read in Luke 16 with Lazarus and the rich man. Immediately he opened his eyes and in hell, in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Right? So that's when the soul eventually dies and the, the spirit is dead with it, but the body is still dead on the earth. This is what would happen to somebody now if they were to die in an unsaved state. So we have the spiritual creation. Then we have the spiritual death when you are held accountable for your sins and that happens very early on in your life. You know, when you are, um, you know, understand the, the laws of God and you are held accountable for your sins. Now let's talk about the spiritual birth. Right? So the spiritual birth is when we believe on Jesus Christ our spirit is made alive again. The Bible talks about being quickened. We are born again. And this is what Jesus refers to in John 3. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, verily means truly. Truly, like verity is truth. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Like a lot of people use this verse to try and prove a, a baptismal regeneration. You know, when you're talking to somebody that believes that you have to be baptized to be saved, you know, whether it's a Pentecostal or whether it's a Catholic, oftentimes they'll go to John 3 and they'll say, hey, see, look, you have to be born of water, you have to be born of the Spirit. And they think, hey, being born of the Spirit, they think, is the spiritual baptism, right? And they think being born of water is the water baptism, which is not. And Jesus clarifies this here in the next verse. He says here in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So what does it mean to be born of water? It is the water birth. It's your physical birth. It's like we talk about when the woman's waters break. This is being born of water. And then being born of the Spirit is when your spirit is made alive again. This is why Jesus, when it talks about Jesus, this is he who came by water and blood. Right? This is not talking about him being baptized and having his sins washed away. This is talking about him being physically born with flesh and blood. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Look at this in verse 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth. What, is, what does listeth mean? It's where, where it wants or where it desires. So this word is related to lust, right? Where it listeth, where it desires. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So this is where I learn about the Spirit. And it sort of made sense. This is Jesus saying, hey, you can hear the Spirit. You can hear the Spirit of God. You can hear the Spirit of somebody, but you can't see it. You can't see where it's coming and going, especially the Holy Spirit here in John 3. Obviously, you know where the Spirit of the man is. It's dwelling in his body. But the Spirit of God is all over the place. You don't know where it goes and where it comes, but you hear it. You hear the Word of God, and that's when you know the Spirit of God is present. Ephesians 2, look at this. But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sin. So this is talking about, you see how we were dead, the Spirit is dead once we're held accountable for our sins, hath quickened us together with Him. So the Bible uses this word quickened, and that doesn't mean it's just made to go faster, like we would think of quickened. Quicken means you're made alive. It's an older word that we don't really use. Us together with Christ, by grace you say. And it's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. 
For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you see here, we are born spiritually alive. We're held accountable for our sins. We die. And then when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we, our spirit is quickened. Our spirit is made alive. We are born again. This is the first fruits of the spirit. And now we can be called a child of God, even though we still dwell in the sinful nature that we inherited from Adam. This is the new creature, right? This is the born again, born of God, right? The begotten child of God, spiritually, right? So Jesus is the only begotten son of God, physically, right? Because where did we get this body? We got this body, we inherited from Adam. But the spirit is born again, and this spirit does not sin. Now, if you understand this struggle that is going on, and what's the mechanics of what is going on within your body as a saved believer, this is the state that we exist in now. The state we exist in now is we live in a sinful body. The soul is who we are, and we have a born-again spirit if we are a believer on Jesus Christ. So this is the struggle that Paul is referring to in Romans 7. So we'll just go it a bit slowly, go through it a bit slowly, because it's a bit of a tongue twister. And if you've read it yourself in Romans 7, you probably have no idea what he's talking about. And um, if you don't really know where to pause in the sentences, you can get yourself a bit confused. So in verse 14, let's go through it. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So, right, what's the law? The law brings life. But if you're spiritual, you obey the law. But unfortunately, he's carnal. He's breaking the law, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. So he's saying, hey, the things that I do, I normally wouldn't permit, right? Because there's this struggle in himself. So the things he doesn't permit in his life, he's doing it. For what I would, what does he mean here, I would? Not like the way that we would use this term. We would say, you know, that would or I will do something is like something you're going to do in the future. When the Bible sometimes uses this term, I would, this is talking about the past tense of I will, what I want. So he's saying here, what I would want to do, that do I not. So he's saying the things that I want to do, I'm not doing. So you say here, what, what is it, what is he saying here? What is he referring to here? But now that you understand this struggle between the flesh and the spirit, and it's talked about in Galatians 5, this is what Paul is referring to. He's saying, hey, there's a part in him who wants to do right, he's not doing it. The things, there's a part in him that doesn't allow these things, but he's doing it anyway. For what I would, what I want to do, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. I'm doing the things that I hate. If then I do that which I would not. So if I'm doing the things I don't want to do, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So now he start, he's, he's explaining now. Hey, it's not actually him. Why? Because we, as born-again believers, tend to identify with the born-again spirit, the child of God. That's our new identity. So here you can see Paul separating himself, even though it's him, right? It's his flesh, but he's separating it, his identity from, hey, it's the sin that dwells in me, the flesh, and him who wants to follow God. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will, so that's why he's saying I would, for to, the desire to want to do the right thing, for to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good I find not. You can see here this struggle to know what the right thing to do is, but not doing it. For the good that I would, I do not. See, so the good things that I want to do, I don't do them. That's what that sentence is saying. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. You see what he's saying there? The wrong things that I don't want to do, I'm doing them. And if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you'll know this is the struggle in the Christian life. This is the daily battle that we need to overcome. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. If you think about the beginning of Romans 7, you think, what does marriage have to do with it? Because he's likening that marriage relationship and when one of the spouses die, you're free to marry another. This is what it works like in the spiritual life. 
because when we believe on Jesus Christ, we, phys- we spiritually sort of crucified with him. The Bible is saying here, now that we're born again, we now have the freedom to now marry somebody else, right? So that's the, the struggle here, that we're constantly going back to the, to the flesh, but being born again, it's freed us from only being bound to the flesh, and we now have the ability to walk in the Spirit. But it's a daily struggle, right? It's not just one or the other. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Right? So he says, I find a law in his mind when he wants to do good, but he's still doing wrong. So you can see that both are present. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. So remember, uh, I want to go back to that, that, uh, that, that picture. That's why it's interesting that we talk about the inward man, the spirit that's in there. So he's delighting, that inward man, that new spirit, is delighting after God's commandments, wanting to do what's right. But I see another law in my members. What is this? This is the desire to sin. Warring against the law of my mind. Why? Because he, his soul, he wants to do what's right. Bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So there you can see that dynamic in that passage that his mind, I believe his, your mind is the soul here. So if you think every day, you know, as you struggle to do what's right, you're making a decision whether to do what's right or what's wrong. This is this battle that's going on. Are you going to follow the flesh, the law of the flesh, or are you going to follow the law, you know, the law of the spirit that delights after the law of God? Now let's go to some passages where it refers to these two natures and that some people you know, misunderstand. So in 2 Corinthians 5, it says here, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now why is this teaching important? To understand what happens once you get saved and how the different natures that you have, the body, soul, and spirit work in salvation. Because oftentimes when people will go to a passage like this, They'll say, like, well, once you get saved, hey, you should be a new creature. You shouldn't be sinning anymore. You should be changing. And that's something that happens when you say, hey, maybe you haven't changed as much as you think you have or you should have. Maybe you're not really saved. So people make you doubt your salvation because you still sin. Now, if you understand this, you understand why you still sin. Because there's that struggle between the body and the spirit. And the soul has to constantly strive to follow the spirit rather than follow the flesh. Now, some people believe that this passage is saying, hey, well, once you're saved, it's just going to, like, change this whole thing. And if you're still sinning, then maybe the Spirit isn't there. Because, you know, if the Spirit was there, you, you wouldn't be sinning. The Bible says, hey, you're a new creature. But look at what this verse actually says, if we look at it closely. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. I agree with you. He is the new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, look at this. All things are become new. Now, if you were to look at what actually happens, are all things new in this whole picture? No. Because when you got saved, did the body change? No. No. Still the same sinful body that you had prior to your salvation. That's why if you don't walk in the Spirit, if you don't purpose in your heart to do what's right, you will be the exact same person you were before. That's why people say, well, you know, a person's not saved. Look, they're just living exactly how they were before. That doesn't necessarily mean they're not saved. That just means they're walking in the flesh. Because if they're walking completely in the flesh, you know what? You will be exactly how you were before. Right? You have to put on the new man. This is what this all things is talking about. This is not talking about the Christian as a whole. This is talking about this. Because the born-again spirit, the child of God, all things are new there. That thing cannot sin. Ephesians 4, look, this is why we exhorted that she put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts of flesh, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So you see, this is something you have to do. This is not something that happens automatically. You have to put on the new man. It's like when you got saved, you got given a new suit. But you have to put that suit on for people to see it, for it to benefit anybody else. Right? It doesn't just happen automatically. And this is why here in Ephesians, 
Paul is exhorting the Ephesians, hey, to take off the old garment, right? Because by default, that's the one you're going to be wearing every day if you don't do anything about it. You've got to put off that old man and you've got to put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. This is something you have to do. You, your soul, has to decide, I'm going to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. And that's when you'll start to grow in the spiritual life. This is the struggle. So one thing I wanted you to take away from this is don't be discouraged if that struggle is there. Yes, the struggle is there. Yes, we want to strive to defeat it. But don't be discouraged if the struggle is there. That doesn't mean you're not saved. Right? In fact, that's a good sign you are saved if that struggle is there, right? Because you can see there's a battle going on inside of you. Right? But don't be caught up in this whole idea that just because you have the same desires as you did before, that you're ne not necessarily saved. No, you can be saved and have the exact same desires as you once had. Right? It's a struggle. Matthew 7, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. So now you understand this concept, flesh and the spirit. Now you can understand what's going on here, right? When it likens it to a corrupt tree and a good tree. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. So if this good tree is just talking about the Christian as a whole, this would prove that all of us are corrupt trees, right? Because a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. So this cannot be talking about the Christian as a whole. What is that good tree? The good tree is that born-again spirit child of God that cannot sin. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. So we see that difference between the good tree and the bad tree, and this is the same as the difference between the body and the spirit, the, sp the flesh and the spirit. 1 John 3, this is how you can understand verses that tend to mislead people in 1 John 3. Look at 1 John 3, 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Now, if somebody was reading this passage in 1 John 3 and they were humble enough to know that they're a sinner that still commits sin and somebody was to tell them, this is how you tell whether you're saved or not, 1 John 3. Who can be saved according to 1 John 3 8? I mean, isn't this, if we were to understand 1 John 8 as the Christian as a whole, wouldn't that just prove that all of us are children of the devil? We're all not saved because we're all... So what is, it, what is it referring to? What is it talking about? No, because this is a comparison between the flesh and the spirit, right? He that committed sin is the flesh, like, like Paul mentioned in Romans 7. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So notice that not only are we saved from the punishment of sin, one day we're going to be saved from the power of sin over us in our sinful flesh, right? Because we'll be in a new body. And one day we're going to be gone from the presence of sin when there's a new heaven and a new earth. Verse 9, look at this. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. So if you think this passage is talking about the believer as a whole, again, this is going to prove that you're not saved, right? But what is it talking about? It's talking about that born again spirit. The born of God spirit doth not commit sin, for his sin remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. So notice that. That born again spirit that is quickened cannot sin. It's not possible that that spirit can sin. So that's why when you walk in the spirit, you're sinless. You walk in the flesh, you sin. But unfortunately, in this world we have both. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So this is how you can see the difference between those that are of God and those that are of the devil because it's righteousness and sin. Galatians 5. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. You know, I wish, uh, you know, walking in the spirit was automatic. Because if it was automatic, it'd be a lot 
easier in the Christian life, but it's not. It's something you must strive to do daily. And you know what? If you don't wake up in the morning and purpose in your heart that you're going to do what's right, that you're going to walk in the Spirit, you know what the default's going to be? The default's going to be you walk in the flesh. This is why we, we are in an uphill climb in the Christian life. We're like on an escalator the wrong way going back. And you've got to walk just to, just to stay where you are. Right? And that's why you've got to put some effort in if you're going to go forward because unfortunately we have gravity on our side. Romans 8 here, look, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So this is how we are currently in the world. And the last step I want to talk about is the spiritual body. The spiritual body. So one day we're going to be given a new body. 1 Corinthians 15. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, right? So this is that corrupt body. It's sown in corruption. Talking about us. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. This is why, you know, Christians, they try and bury the dead because it's that picture of sowing the seed into the ground that one day is going to be raised as a new body it is sown a natural body it is raised a spiritual body so the natural body is the one we inherited from adam that original sin nature that causes us to sin one day that body is going to be sown it's going to die and it's going to be raised a spiritual body for those of us who are saved there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body we skip down a few verses to verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpets shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality so you see there one day the resurrection we're going to be given a new body we're going to be given this spiritual body right this new body that is sinless romans 8 for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of god see right now you can't see the sons of god right it's a spiritual kingdom right now we're spiritually sons of god but what what are you seeing here you're not seeing the son of god here Right? You're seeing a son of the devil, right? a sinner here, the flesh. But you see here the earnest expectation of the creature, what I am waiting for as a creature. I'm waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. What is it? It's when we get our physical bodies. And now you'll see us not only spiritually but physically as sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity. What's this? We live in this vain, sinful world. Not willingly, but by reason of him who have subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So talking about us as a person, we're going to be delivered from this sinful world into uh, the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. I mean, we talked about suffering in Kids Club this morning. There's a lot of suffering in this world. A lot of groaning and travailing, right? For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, so not that born again Spirit within us, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. So you notice there that we are children of Adam. We are born of God spiritually. We are begotten of God spiritually. But when we are given our new bodies, this is a creation of God. It's the spiritual body that clothes us in the new, uh, as we rule and reign with Jesus Christ, we are then adopted as children of God. So physically, we are sons of God adopted, but spiritually, we are begotten sons. And Jesus Christ is the only begotten son because he's the only one physically born of the holy ghost philippians 3 we'll sh see this uh, last uh, another passage here where our body will be changed 
for our conversation is in heaven, for whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So let's have a look. So these are the steps that a believer goes through, just to recap. So this is how we're born. We're born spiritually alive in the earth and we've inherited the sinful nature from Adam. When we are held accountable for our sins, we die. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Our spirit is born again. Now, if we were to die now, our soul and spirit will separate from our body and we will be alive in heaven. Why? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So our body there is dead on the earth. Now at the resurrection, we will be given a new body and we'll have a new body, soul and spirit. And this is why the Bible talks about salvation in terms of steps. It's not saying that it requires more than just faith to commence this process, right? Because once we believe on Jesus Christ, we believe the first fruits of the Spirit and we're sealed unto the day of redemption. But in Romans 13, it can use phrases like this. It says, And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. This is talking about us going through life, going through life awake to what's going on in the world. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. What is this one talking about? Right, Because we get saved first, we get the first fruits of the Spirit, but one day we will be completely saved, both all body and both body and spirit. That's why we have salvation in terms of spiritual salvation. And one day we're going to get our physical salvation when we are resurrected. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, like they're putting off the old man. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the last thereof. So that's the steps that a believer goes through. What about the steps an unbeliever goes through? Right, the unbeliever. In Matthew 10, it says here, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I want you to notice this, that both soul and body go to hell. This is why we know this passage in Matthew 10, 28 is referring to when hell is relocated to the lake of fire and both soul and body are destroyed there. Revelation 20, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. So in Revelation 20, we read about the white throne judgment. This is when we are we in the resurrection are already combined with our new bodies. But those who are dead are, are recombined with their corrupt body, those that are unsaved unbelievers. They also come out of hell. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. So you see here, standing before God, and we will be there as well, are not only us who have already received our new bodies, but it's those who have gotten saved through the millennial kingdom. They will be raised with a new body at this point. But then those who are not saved, or those who come out of hell, right? they, are, they will be given their same corrupt body. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So how does it work for the unbeliever? For the unbeliever, they're born spiritually alive like everybody else. When they're held accountable for their sin, they reach the age of accountability. We don't know what age that is. They die spiritually. This is why the Bible can say in Genesis, in Genesis when God talks to Adam, in the day that thou eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Because when Adam ate of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. Notice that, the knowledge of the tree of the good and evil. He died immediately. It's the same with the age of accountability. When they have the knowledge of good and evil, they die to the sin that they have. The difference is that was Adam's first sin. But with babies, you know, they're already sinning. They're held accountable for that um, when they reach the age of accountability. Now when the unbeliever dies, 
Their soul separates from their body. The body without the spirit is dead. They immediately descend into hell, like the rich man in Luke 16. And in hell he lifts up his eyes, being in torment. Right? And, be, and why does the soul go to hell? Because the spirit is dead. If the spirit is alive, it goes to heaven. Now at the white throne judgment, the white throne judgment, everybody is resurrected. Now either you're resurrected to life or you're resurrected to damnation. The unbeliever is then reunited with their corrupt body before God and their spirit is still dead. So there is a moment of reprieve here from hell. Because notice here that if an unbeliever was to die now, they would be in hell in the center of the earth. Right? And one day hell is going to be relocated. So if they were to die now, before the millennial reign, when they come out at the white throne judgment, they have been tormented in hell for a minimum of a thousand years. Right? White throne judgment, there is a moment of reprieve. And this is why you wonder, why will every knee bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father? Because even the most hardened atheist, the most hardened Muslim, the most hardened, you know, work salvation Roman Catholic, they on that day will also be begging, acknowledging Jesus Christ as Lord, begging to be saved. But it's too late for them because they would just be brought out to be judged according to their works. And the Bible says, you know, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So now body, soul, and spirit, like it said in Matthew 10, fear not him that is able to kill the body, but rather fear him that is able to kill both soul and body in hell. So this is why we know it's talking about the final judgment when they're cast into hell. Because when you go to hell now, as an unbeliever, your body does not go to hell. Your body is dead on there. We bury the body. You know, and people, unfortunately, that they've deluded themselves or they have deceived themselves into believing something else. Or somebody that dies that's not saved, you know, they say, oh, they've gone on to go to a better place. But unfortunately, if they're not saved, if they haven't believed on Jesus Christ, they haven't gone on to a better place. It's a sad thing when somebody dies without Jesus Christ because their soul is in hell and it's uh, too late for them now. And one day they'll be resurrected, the white throne judgment, and both soul and body will be cast into hell. So, what do I want us to take away from this sermon today? I hope you learned today the different stages of spiritual life and how, it, how the mechanics works. And the Bible gives us enough information to understand the human nature you know, this is why like, people, people have different ways to describe the human nature. The world will say, oh, we, we're good by nature and it's all that sort of stuff. So if we understand the explanation that God gives us in the Bible, we understand what is going on and we can, we can judge why we have this struggle and why this is going on. We can understand why people that are saved don't necessarily live the way they ought. Because we don't want to be duped into believing a workspace salvation, a workspace salvation, when we start saying things like, well, if that person was really saved, they wouldn't live how they used to live. You know, that person's living just how they used to live, you know, before they were saved, you know, maybe they're not saved. That is not how we should necessarily judge salvation, if that person is confessing salvation by Jesus Christ. If they confess the right salvation, we can judge and say, look, I think maybe that person is saved. They understand salvation, but... You know, they're just walking in the flesh. And all of us do this to an extent. You know, so don't get too so high-minded in your own life that you think, oh, you know, I'm doing so great. Hey, take heed lest you fall. Right? You just ought to be grateful that maybe you're at a stage where you're on the up and up. But you're going to have times in your life, you know, where you backslide and you are not living how you ought. And, you know, sometimes you, sometimes you need to go through those stages in life because that gives you a bit of empathy with people that are not living right. You know, yeah, sometimes people too, that are too high-minded and think, oh, if you're saved and you're going to do all this good stuff, they look at people that are not saved and then they're quick to judge. Oh, they're not saved, look at how they're living. Until one day you're like that person. You know, you're out of church, you're backslidden, you're you know, not caring about things, you're back into the old sins. And then you realise, man, this struggle's real. Like, you know, maybe that person that I thought wasn't saved because of the way they live, they could be saved. So, understand why people that are saved don't necessarily live right. 
You don't want to necessarily doubt your salvation because you fall back into the, the, these old sins. But understand this war within yourself so that you take those steps to overcome the flesh. This is a daily war. You can't be so careless as to just coast in the Christian life. Because you know what? If you coast in the Christian life, it's like standing on that escalator. It's just going to start pulling you back. All right? So you need to make sure daily you're trying to walk in that spirit because if you don't, the default is you're going to walk in the flesh. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the reminder this mor morning of this daily struggle that we all experience. Lord, help us to overcome the flesh daily. Help us, help us in our mind, Lord, to want to walk in the Spirit, to obey the law of God rather than the law of sin. And uh, Lord, we need your grace. It's, it's difficult. We're fighting against gravity, Lord. So help us. Help us to purpose in our heart to do what's right. So, Lord, we just don't automatically go back into our old ways and do damage to your kingdom rather than good. So, Lord, I pray for the people here. Pray for myself. Lord, help us all to walk in the Spirit. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.